It has been a few weeks since I have the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro and M1 Max in the studio to run a whole lot of tests. After all this time, I have a few thoughts about the machine, so I am going to give you my wrap up review for these new computers and also give you a data driven approach as far as how can you go out and configure the best machine for your creative workflow. Let's find out together. This is Artist Right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. As usual, this will be an information rich wrap up review. And I will also share with you a data driven configuration guide later on too. If you want to jump ahead, there's timestamp in the description below. If you receive your machine already, congratulations. If you haven't yet, I hope that yours come in soon. And if you haven't configured on yet, you're watching the right video. Let's start out with the most impressive machine in this lineup. And I will award that to the base 14 inch MacBook Pro 8 CPU, 14 GPU. If you've gone out and upgrade this machine, for example, the memory to 32 gigabytes and one terabyte SSD, and we keep this the same throughout. This machine is pretty much within the hair of all the other machines as you're going to find out later on when I'm sharing you the charts and the data that I have gathered. So if you're a student, if you're more budget conscious, if you want a lighter machine, this is definitely the one that you may want to consider. If you're a pro like myself and you want to shave every second out of your computing experience or your editing experience, then I definitely would go in and upgrade from this base processor. But I mean, the base one is a really amazing machine. It is one that impressed me the most out of this whole bunch. Now for my build, I have chosen to go with a 16 inch MacBook Pro and I've gone with the M1 Max. 10 CPU, 32 GPU, 64 gigabytes of memory, and two terabyte SSD. I would have gone with the 14 inch model saving for the screen size. I like the size, the weight of it, but the screen size to me is just too small. And I really want to work on the road on a larger screen with more pixels on it. So that's the reason why I choose a 16 inch MacBook Pro. In the next two to four weeks, I will be trying this machine out as my primary machine replacing my Mac Pro and see if this is going to work out. Should I really just sell out my Mac Pro and just keep this for the time being until Apple release another Mac Pro machine with the Apple Silicon inside? We shall see. I'll give you another video update down the road once I have a better feel for this machine. But so far, the only one thing about this configuration, if I'm going to use it as my primary machine that I don't like is the two terabyte SSD. I filled it up with data extremely quickly and I really want to get the four terabyte SSD but if I've gone out and configure one today, it won't be until the end of January or early February until I get the machine. So I might just end up keeping this one. The one thing I want to start out first is the optimization. A lot of the apps that we're using, the creative apps for photography, hasn't yet been optimized for these M1 Pro and M1 Max yet. So at this point in time, what we're really doing, it's throwing a whole lot of power at it. And the program is really just using that brute force power without a lot of optimization. Is it doing fairly well? Yeah, I mean, these machines, the SoC on here are really capable and they're doing really well. But I think that once we have the optimization, we're gonna see a bigger performance improvement. So make sure you stay tuned to the channel for that because I will release a video for app specific improvement once they have released an update. The other thing we have to remember about getting these new machines, especially towards like the October to the end of the year timeframe is that Apple will ship this new machine with the new operating system right away. And that can be a good and bad thing. The thing about the new operating system is that there are a lot of bugs on the system that hasn't been ironed out yet in the .0 or .0.1 version. And usually I wait until .1 before I go through an upgrade. The other thing about these new OS too is that certain apps will not work, certain drivers for printer will not work. It breaks certain softwares that comes from the past. So that's just another thing to remember as you're getting these machines that it's not always the most rosy of experience. And as you're seeing right now, a lot of the creative pro apps hasn't been optimized for these yet. So everything is just a matter of time. But if you want to jump on to the bleeding edge now, you can. And well, you're in the same boat I am. All right, so we know that these machines comes in two variety, the M1 Pro and M1 Max. And we're going to start by talking about the design. It is highly reminiscent of the Titanium PowerBook. I love the square off edges of the uh, computer in general. And this also increased the cavity on inside the machine too. So Apple doesn't have to build everything that's thin all the time. In fact, it does gain 
a little bit in weight and also in dimension on the 16 inch model compared to the 2019 16 inch MacBook Pro. But when you hold them side by side, you don't feel that big of a difference. I think more so than just the weight or the dimension itself, it's just a feel on the hand that the other machine from 2019 feel a little bit thinner because it is tapered off around the edges. But I really like this design in general. Now, if Apple would have gone in and put a translucent key like the titanium power book, I mean, that would be really cool, but we obviously didn't get that. I think these black keys are okay too. I'm fine with that. The ports are back. Everyone excited about that. I am too, to an extent, because for what I do, I carry dongles all the time, so it's not really a big deal for me. But I know that for a lot of other people, you don't like to carry dongles or buy a whole bunch of dongles, and it does make a big difference. For now, what you can do is literally link this up to a HDTV using HDMI port right away without any problems. If your camera still uses an SD card slot, you can plug it right into the machine. The only problem that I have about the SD card slot is that it's not necessarily the fastest, that's number one. And secondly, we're in this midst of a card slot transition to CF Express Type A, CF Express Type B. So having this on the machine, I understand why Apple took it away because it does date the machine a little bit, but I know that there are a lot of cameras out there that many of us are using that still has an SD card. Personally for me, if there's an SD card and another format like CF or XQD or CF Express, I tend to use the other one before I use SD, so the SD is a backup, but every one workflow is different, and if you use an SD card, well, these are really great machines for you. And MagSafe is back, I really like that. And transitioning that, we're going to quickly talk about power adapter. On the 16 inch one, it comes with 140 watt, and that's Apple first scan power charger, which makes it like smaller size, and it can produce a lot more power, so that's really a great thing to see. And these machines also support fast charging, on the 16 inch, you can only do fast charging using the MagSafe charger. On the 14 inch model, you can do fast charging as long as you have the 96 watt power adapter or higher, and you can do fast charging on both the MagSafe and USB type C. If you are configuring a 14 inch model though, and you are choosing a base one, I highly recommend spending that extra $20 and upgrading it to the 96 watt power adapter so you can do fast charging on the system. The other thing too that I really like about the MagSafe is that it's not built into the adapter anymore. On one end, it is a USB Type-C. On the other end, it is MagSafe. And this will allow you to pretty much use any power adapter that you choose. So you don't have to use an Apple one, but if you want to use an Apple one, you definitely can do that. And they do include that in the box. The other great thing about these machines in general is that we have equal performance when the machine is on battery power and when it is plugged in. This is something that we haven't really seen from the Intel machine before, because normally those processors are really power hungry. So the moment you pull the power out, guess what? It's going to start throttling down the performance in order to save power and make the laptop battery last longer. Well, not on these machines. The performance is exactly the same when I'm editing just on battery power and when I plug in, no difference whatsoever. The thermal is also really good. And speaking of thermal in general, between the M1 Pro and M1 Max that I'm testing, I haven't noticed too much of a difference. The M1 Max may get a little bit hotter because it has more GPU on it, but I don't think it's any call for concern choosing one over the other over thermal. It's not worth it. Just choose the machine based on the configuration that you want. And you're going to find that this is the theme for this wrap up review and also configuration guide too. When it comes to fan noise, the question I always ask myself is what fan noise? I mean, it takes a lot for me to push this machine until the fan turns on. And a lot of times what I have to do to really get the fan hitting, it's not Lightroom export, but rather doing a whole bunch of Final Cut Pro footage exporting through compressor. And if you add like so many footage together and the machine started to get hot, yes, the fans start to turn on. But it's quite a while since I heard a fan on these machines. It's extremely quiet and that's something that I really enjoy about them. So talking about the battery life, thermal, and performance in general, one of the things that I want to share with us is to go out there and configure the machine based on your need, based on what you need in your workflow. Don't worry too much about the specs. Don't worry about the fact that the 16 inch is going to have longer battery life, or you're going to cut down the processor speed and going for the M1 Pro instead of Max, even though you may use that because you want a machine that the battery lasts longer. Let me put it this way. Relatively speaking, all of these M1 Pro and M1 Max, it's definitely going to push the 2019 16-inch Intel 
way back anyway because that machine can only do about 11 hours on battery on these one it can do up to 17 on the 14 inch model and 21 on the 16 inch model it has a very long battery life but what you should really choose is the size of machine that fits in with your needs for example if you are in a city that uses a lot of public transportation and you don't have a car or you don't really drive a car and you have to have the laptop on your back or on your side the whole time well the 14 inch is definitely something to consider because it is a lighter weight on you if you have a disability that prevents you from carrying a lot of weight on your back or on your shoulder well the 14 inch one is going to be perfect and if you need the power get the 14 with the m1 max who cares if it runs a touch slower than the 16 inch one there are other needs beyond just pure configuration power and that's something that we always have to remember and keep in the back of our mind as we are building these machine out. The other one thing I wanna talk about is the afterburner for video. So essentially on these machines with the encoder decoder engine, what Apple have done is built the afterburner on the Mac Pro inside these machines. So if you do video, I mean, get the M1 Max because of the double encoder decoder engine, you really cut the export time in half. And on my Mac Pro 2019 without the afterburner card, all these machines on the table right now, both the M1 Pro and M1 Max, already beat out my Mac Pro. So that just really gives you an idea as to the power and performance that these computers have. The keyboard, what can I say? I like them to be translucent, but they are really great keyboards and I enjoy typing on them. And no more dust going in there, preventing things from working like the butterfly keyboard from the yesteryear. So great improvement. Speakers, I mean, the 2019 model was really great. This makes it even more awesome with the spatial audio. I mean, if you're watching Apple TV, for example, I was watching Foundation on here and you just sit in front of a computer, you have that simulated surround sound experience. I haven't seen another laptop that can really do something like this or even the previous MacBook Pro. So this is super impressive and I really enjoy this experience a lot, especially if I'm in a hotel room or I'm on the road somewhere and I want to play some music. Well, these speakers are loud and they sound really great. The notch, well, honestly, after using it for a while, I haven't noticed a notch, or if I see it, I don't really care about. So that's where the menu would go. No big deal for me. The only thing that I wish about this is that the app developers would upgrade their app and accommodate the notch in the menu system because on some program, there are a lot of menus and it started to go on to the other side of the notch. So that's just the only thing that I have to say about that. But once I go in and optimize for it, I think we're going to be fine. The mic and the webcam is really great. I think that to use this in a hotel room or to use it for conference call, I think it works perfectly fine. If I'm recording a video like this, I probably won't use the built-in microphone and laptop just because I do have a better mic that I can use. But if I need to do something in a bind really quickly, these are extremely capable with like three microphones and everything. It can differentiate the sound and it goes to the signal processing on the SoC itself. So just really awesome. Same thing with the webcam 1080 and it goes through the signal processing on the SoC, so your pictures generally look a lot better, and that's just really awesome. Built-in display recalibration, I'll probably end up doing a separate video about this, talking about HDR later on and drilling into some deep portions of this new Liquid Retina XDR display, but I have already released a calibration guide to it. I'll leave a link up here and in the description below. You can check that out, but it is one of the best laptop displays that Apple has released, and the characteristic of this display is acts so much similar to a hardware calibrated display. I already mentioned this, that Apple have pretty much built this in and they vertically integrate everything so they can calibrate this display to these computers very specifically and store all those data on the computer somewhere so that you can go in and choose all these different reference mode. In fact, you can create your own custom reference mode and that is what I recommend for Creative Pros is to choose the reference mode that you want to use. And one thing that I also will tell you is that you should probably avoid using the Apple XDR display or the Apple display in general, the first two modes, because that has the variable brightness and everything. You want to go in and just really use the reference mode and fix that brightness. But there is a quick way to change that on the system using the menu bar so you don't have to go into system preferences all, all the time. And again, I'll release that video later on. If you have the right tool and the right equipment, you can watch my guide and do a white point fine tune. Once you do the white point fine tune, it applies to all of the reference mode, not just the one specific one that you did the fine tune on, but fine tuning definitely does help and it brings the color even closer to a hardware calibrated display, which is something that I do like. 
Now, the only thing I have to say about these displays is that they are glossy. And I wish that Apple would release a nano etching option similar to their Pro Display XDR because I think if they do that, these will be a really great display for a photographer to use in the field so that it reflects a lot less. Because I'll tell you right now, I have a little screen bar going on on my desk setup. And when I'm using this machine, I can see my reflection on the display. And that's just something that is kind of distracting working with these compared to a matte display in general or the one with nano etching. All right. External display and calibration, there's no issue whatsoever. Some of the hardware calibrated displays may need software to be upgraded. And in general, even with software calibration, software needs to be updated first to be fully optimized to take advantage of these machines, especially the built-in display. But for the external one, you can go out and calibrate without a lot of issues. There may be some optimization here and there, but for the most part, you'll be fine. I have released an extensive guide on this as well for the M1 Pro and M1 Max. So the M1 Pro can only handle two external display total. It doesn't really matter if you run it in clamshell or not, or the type of connection they use. It can only support two external displays. On the M1 Max, it can support four. And you can check out that video where I test Final Cut Pro, Capture One, and also Lightroom to see where the slowdown really shows up when we start to really run multiple displays. Now let's talk about your build. What should you choose for your configuration? Remember that none of the components inside the machine are upgradable down the road. So you want to build the machine that you want that is best suited for your workflow right away. And the other thing I also want to tell you is that don't configure this machine for what you're going to need today or tomorrow. Configure this machine for what you're going to need down the road, especially if you keep your machine longer. For example, if you keep it for three to five years, I would definitely go in and upgrade the components maybe a little bit more so that when these apps in the future demand more from the system, you do have something to give to it rather than running on the slow machine and having to go there and upgrade the computer. So that's just something to think about. One thing I want to add about these machines too is that you want to go in and configure the machine based on the creative greatest common denominator. Meaning that if you need more capability for certain apps, you want to configure the highest capability possible because that will all trickle down to the app that uses less of the performance of the machine. And you're going to see what I'm talking about in just a second. When it comes to size, that's the big first decision. You have to decide between the 14 and 16 inch. I have already mentioned that there are more factors to choose from than just battery life, thermal performance, and all these other things. If weight is an issue, but you need a more powerful machine, go with the 14 and the M1 Max. Don't worry about the speed difference between the 14 inch M1 Max and the 16 inch M1 Max. There are other needs that you have to accommodate for and it's not worth it to really think about these machines just right down to like the megahertz that it runs. Just choose the machine that is best suited for you and what you need. When it comes to CPU and GPU, one of the things we have to remember about this is that they are a SOC, meaning that they are a system on a ship and everything is integrated in. One thing that I want to remind us is that the moment we have reached that 10 core plateau on the M1 Pro and M1 Max, well, they are pretty much the same 10 cores. And the way how this is done on the system is that there's always two high efficiency cores. These are the cores that run the tasks in the background. They don't have too much power, but they keep the machine running really smoothly. So when you need more power, the high performance core would jump in. And the difference between this 10 core and the 8 core is that the 8 core has two less high performance, but that really doesn't translate too much into a big real world difference as you're about to see. So between the M1 Pro and M1 Max, it is the exact same 10 core once you have reached that mark. So if you have a task that rely heavily on CPU usage, there's not going to be a big difference between the top M1 Pro or the M1 Max processor. Now we take a look at the configuration for these computers. There are a variety of ways that we can go build them out. For example, if you start with the 14 inch one from the base to go up to the M1 Max, the top one is $700. That is quite a steep price increase. And you're going to see in just a moment when I show you the data, it's not going to be too big of a difference whatsoever. On the 16 inch model, this is what we're looking at. The price gap between the two is not quite as steep, but you may not need the top M1 Max processor. Another thing I want to point out is that on the 16 inch MacBook Pro, you have the option to go in under system preferences battery and choose between low power automatic and high power mode. 
In my testing, automatic and high power performs pretty much just about the same. I haven't seen or noticed any big difference between the two yet. I will do more testing on this as soon as I have more time and hopefully publish a video on this. But this is not available on the 14 inch model. So if you want the greatest performance, definitely 16 inch will do. But as I mentioned before, choose a size and machine that best fits for your need and don't worry about the performance. You're going to get great performance out of each machine regardless. Let's have a look at Lightroom Classic 1000 file export. This is 1000 Nikon D850 file. If you want to see a fuller chart with a lot more comparisons, I'll leave links to the previous testing video that I've done that go over each one of these machines. You will see a comparison between the Apple Silicon, the M1 processor of yesteryear, and also the Intel processor computer from Apple. But for now, we're just going to focus on the data that will help drive us to make the right decisions choosing the machine for what we need. So we take a look at this chart right now. This is around 30 seconds delay, and this is the base 16 inch one, the base M1 Pro. Comparing it to M1 Max, there's not that big of a difference. RAM in Lightroom Classic right now does not make a difference whatsoever. So it's really just the CPU performance, but we're only seeing about a 30 seconds increase. This is pretty much margin of error between this and this. So I wouldn't even say this is a big difference. However, if we take a look at this comparing the M1 Max and the base M1 Pro, you're really talking about two and a half minute increase when we're exporting 1000 files. That's really not that big of a deal at all. So that's why I said, if you are a student, if you're starting out, if you're not a seasoned pro that goes through thousands of files and are constantly counting minutes and seconds, this is definitely a machine that will work really well for what you need. However, if you're like me and you want the best performance possible and you really think about every second that you spend your machine because you photograph so much, then obviously the more higher power processor is definitely going to be the one that you want to think about. Lightroom Classic HDR merge, almost no difference whatsoever. In about a second, these are margin of errors and it's pretty much my human error how fast I can tap on the start stop watch on my phone. So no big difference whatsoever. And if we have a look at Capture One 21 import performance, which rely heavily on the CPU, you can see that between the Max and the Pro processor, 10 core, it's only a few seconds different. It's not that big of a deal at all. However, when we compare, for instance, the Max one to the base M1 Pro, you're talking about three, four minutes. But I mean, this is number one, unoptimized. And secondly, you're saving $700. So if that $700 is worth it for you when you're dealing with 1000 Nikon D850 files at 45 megapixel, then definitely get the M1 Max. But otherwise, you're not really going to see too big of a difference or the top M1 Pro in this situation. Photoshop speed, comparing all these right now, they're pretty much within the same range of each other across all these machines. So we're not going to see too big a difference in these CPU based tasks in Photoshop. However, this is something to think about. If you do video, for instance, H.264 export 4K from a Panasonic S1 8-bit 420. You're seeing the, cut, the export time cut in half between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max processor. Having double that encoder decoder engine is having a huge impact on export time. Same thing again on HEVC 8-bit. You can see that the time get cut in half on the Max variety of machine versus the Pro. So if you do video, definitely consider getting the Max processor. When it comes to 4Res 422 export, you're not seeing too big of a difference here. However, it does show a greater performance on the M1 Max versus the M1 Pro. So then what about the GPU? Which GPU should you choose? Well, here's a chart with Capture One 21 export performance, which rely heavily on GPU performance in the machine. So what we're really supposed to see here is that when we go from 16 to 32 GPU and this M1 Pro versus the M1 Max, we're supposed to see the time cut in half, but we're not seeing that yet. We're only seeing about a 33% time improvement. And this is because Capture One is not fully optimized to take advantage of these extra GPU on the system yet. When that happens, I think we're going to see a better performance from these machines. And one other thing I want to point out is that on the 24 GPU M1 Max, this time is an estimated time. I will have a 24 core GPU one into the CEO later on in December. So I'll do a testing on that and share with you the result then. But for now, I'm just averaging the time and that's what we're seeing.
Now that you have seen this data, let's have a look at the processor configuration. Starting with the 14 inch one, if you are starting out, you're a student, you're more budget conscious, this is definitely the machine for you. It does really well and it's almost within a hair of even the M1 Max processor. So that is really respectable. However, if you are a seasoned pro and you want to get the most performance and you're just really using Adobe product, I think that these two M1 Pro upgrade would definitely work for you just fine. As far as the difference between the 14 and 16 GPU, I don't think you're going to see that much of a difference at all. But what this does is that it brings you two extra high performance core and brings the CPU total up to 10. So for Adobe product, definitely the M1 Pros are going to do just fine. However, if you use Capture One, I would definitely consider these M1 Max processor and the 24 versus 32 GPU would ultimately depend on how much budget you have and how fast you want your export to be. For instance, we're starting to see a significant time difference of like about three to four minutes or so jumping between the 24 to the 32 GPU. So you may want to upgrade to 32 and get the best performance down the road when, you know, Capture One can really fully utilize these GPU. If you're doing video editing, I definitely recommend getting the M1 Max. And just based on what I'm seeing so far, 24 core GPU will do just fine unless you're doing 3D modeling or anything else extra visual effects that may need more GPU power. Otherwise, I really think that the 24 core is going to work out just fine. On the 16 inch MacBook Pro, the story is a little bit simpler. So you either have the top M1 Pro that is in the 14 inch model, or you just literally go out and upgrade to one of these M1 Macs. And the recommendation is still the same. If you use Capture One or do video editing, definitely go for the Macs. Otherwise, this model right here will work just fine. For memory, if you are a Creative Pro, I definitely recommend choosing 32 gigabytes of memory because it's going to help you further in the long run. There's less swapping to the SSD. Your overall user experience in the Creative Program is going to be much smoother. And the other thing is that if you multitask, for example, running multiple programs at once, Lightroom and Photoshop, Capture One and Photoshop, having web browser running, and also mail program, this is definitely going to help out a lot by minimizing swap on the system. It will still swap, but it will make sure that your experience using the program when you're editing is much smoother than having 16 gigabytes. If you believe that 16 gigabyte work for you, that's perfectly fine. Don't let me convince you otherwise. But for those of you that are more conscious about the user experience on the system, I would definitely choose 32. There is a price jump of $400 going between the 16 to 32 and 32 to 64. So that's just something to think about. The M1 Pro can only go up to 32. The M1 Max can go up to 64, but does not have the 16 gigabyte option. The other thing that we want to talk about briefly is the difference between the memory speed on the M1 Pro and M1 Max. Say you configure both of these at 32 gigabytes. Yes, there is a memory speed difference, but what it really comes down to is that most of the app that's out right now in current day cannot really fully take advantage of that. I will leave a link to an Antec review of the processor, which kind of goes into a lot of depth talking about these things, but it gives you an idea that most of the apps that are on the market today can't really saturate that memory bandwidth. That the extra 200 gigabytes per second on the M1 Max is really designed so that when you load, for example, the 10 core CPU, 32 GPU and the neural engine, along with the, the encoder decoder engine at the same time that it can handle that. But unless you can go out and stress all those things at once, it's not going to make too big of a real world difference. And between these two, what it really comes down to is a difference between two to $500, depending on your configuration. For instance, if you just start out with the base 14 inch model, you are looking at a $700 price increase to go to the top M1 Pro or $500 to go to the 24 core one. It's up to $400 if you decided to go with a 16 inch model. So is 32 gigabytes on a faster interconnect back end worth it? I would say not, especially if you're not going to use the GPU power on the system. So now let's have a look at SSD size and not speed. So a lot of people have been talking about SSD speed. You can configure a bigger one because it is faster. I mean, we're talking about SSD built into a system that can read and write at around close to five gigabytes per second, if not more. What is the big difference between going up one gigabyte per second to six or seven? And you won't really see those top speed until you reach the super high capacity SSD anyway. 
So the best thing that you can do for SSD is choose a size that you are going to need in the future so that you have fast storage inside your system. Because at this point of time, there are no external SSDs that you can link to the system that are bus powered that can have this kind of speed. It may come in the future, but at this point of time, we don't have anything like that yet. So if you want fast storage available at any given time, configure the SSD for what you need right away. So my sweet spot for these SSDs, I think is a one terabyte one. It pretty much fits within the price range really well. It's not too much to really go in and upgrade and it doesn't really break the bank. Going to two terabyte, I think some people may need it. I like to have it because I load a lot of files on there and I want to make sure that I have the space. However, going between four and eight, you're really adding a lot of money into the system that I don't think it's really that much worth it unless your workflow really demands or call for it. But at the end of the day, don't worry about SSD speed, get the size that you are going to need. And you should probably go with at least one terabyte because 512 is going to fill up really quickly. And if the system needs to swap, you may run out of memory sooner than you realize. And let's quickly look at the comprehensive configuration chart based on creative areas. If you have watched my other videos before, you may have seen this. I'll briefly explain this for those of you who haven't. If you want to pause this, you can. But if you're just using Adobe product to do image processing in Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, I will choose between these two first two columns on the 14 and 16 inch model. These will work for you just fine. However, if you do compositing, you work with panel, you work with large files, or you do a lot of creative project in Photoshop, then I would configure these machines instead. And there are two options that you can choose from for each of the size. So there is a budget and optimal. And again, for 16, there is also the budget and optimal that you can choose from. If you are a photographer and you use Capture One, between the 14 and 16 inch, the configuration is pretty much the same. So there is a best budget, which I would say go with the 24 core GPU version. It's not going to perform quite as good as the 32. GPU, but this is going to work just fine. And if you want the optimal best performance, then definitely go with the 32 GPU. And regarding memory, if you're just using Capture One 32 and 64, does not make any difference whatsoever. Capture One is extremely nimble when it comes to memory. If you are a video pro, again, go with the M1 Max processor. Here's the budget configuration and the optimal. So the budget one is the 24 core CPU. Optimal is the 32 core. This is kind of like the best system you can get. And when it comes to optimal, well, if you need 64 gigabytes and get 64, but I think that for Video Pro, 32 gigabytes are going to work just fine. So I want to leave us with this thought, which is something that I already left in one of my other review videos that at the end of the day, we have to stop worrying about the specs and start thinking about the creation process that these are literally just tools that we have in our arsenal to help us be more creative to help us accomplish our vision. And these are more important to have the tools at our fingertip rather than worrying about, for example, if I choose the 32 gigabytes on the Pro and the Max, am I going to see a difference in performance whatsoever? What it really comes down to is that if you have these machines on like an airplane in a coffee shop, nobody's gonna know what machine you have, what configuration you have, and they're all going to perform admirably well. So choose the machine based on the creative workflow that you need, don't buy more because of the higher link speed on the memory. Don't buy a larger SSD size that you're not going to use because of the faster speed for the SSD read and write. Don't buy the 16 inch M1 Max if it's too heavy for you, but you really need the 14 inch model. Choose the one that best fits what you need and just go out there and start creating because that's the whole point about having all these tools at your fingertip is that we can be creative with it. So I hope that you find this helpful. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. Give us a like, subscribe, and hit on the bell when you. And remember, in art we trust.